All right. I think we've just about hit 3 p.m. Pacific. Um, so good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you might all be uh, logging in from. Uh, welcome to today's Modern Excel webinar um, featuring Automation 101, reducing your manual processes by recording and adapting macros in Microsoft Excel. My name is Tim Heng. Um, I'm an Excel MVP that's based in Sydney in Australia. And apologies if you hear any background noise that uh, might be unforeseen. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you are, um, we're currently in uh, relative lockdown working from home. So um, uh, apologies if there's anything that's uh, going on in the background that you might not uh, otherwise expect to hear on a modern Excel webinar. So um, hopefully if you're joining us, you're here to understand um, basically how to go about um, working in Excel to basically reduce your manual processes. Um, and today I've basically been asked to talk about the use of Visual Basic and macros. So this is basically what we're going to be going through in our outline today. Um, we're going to be talking about this, um, I guess, first of all, what VBA really is and what macros are, how they work. Um, we'll talk about how to record and adapt macros, uh, understand some of the high level do's and don'ts of working in VBA, how you can make it um, sort of a little bit safer if you're not accustomed to working for macros. Um, We'll learn how to use some um, simple loops and conditions, uh, what to consider before you go off and copy and paste code from different forums and websites, um, because I know that's something that a lot of folks will do, um, you know, jumping onto tech community, onto Stack Overflow and a bunch of other sites to, uh, to copy code. But um, you know, what are some of the things that we should probably consider before we actually um, go about doing that? And finally, we're, we'll sort of finish off looking at some other tools that are available uh, within the modern Excel environment for performing transformation tasks. Um, while we won't go into those in any severe amount of detail, um, because that's not the intention of this particular uh, webinar, um, the idea is to just be aware that you know, there are other tools out there that you could use um, in lieu of macros. Now, this is not intended to be a um, really deep dive into VBA. I mean, clearly we only have one hour to work through things. So the idea is that we're basically going to give you a high level overview of what VBA is um, and how to start using it. Um, this is not aimed for people who are you know, currently building their own macros and trying to you know, eke out the last little bit of um, the, the last 1% of performance they want to get out of it. Uh, this is really aimed at people who have heard of macros, perhaps use macros that other people have created for them, and are kind of curious how to get started themselves. So with that said, um, let's go ahead and start talking about um, what is VBA and how do we actually get started? So VBA um, is an acronym, it stands for Visual Basic for Applications. It's a relatively simple coding language that's used in Excel and a lot of the other Office applications. Um, and it's object-based programming, the idea being that you've got um, objects or you know, nouns, things. You've got properties, which are adjectives. Um, and you've got methods, which are basically verbs, doing actions. Um, and so an example of this, uh, the way that you would see um, code in VBA presented is an object and a property. Um, so for example, um, and you can see some of these examples have uh, been inspired by um, working from home and uh, the little daughter that I have running around. Um, I might have my, you know, this is not my dog. Uh, that's the object. Um, the property is the coat. And the reason uh, I can set the coat to be too hairy. So um, the object has a property and that property's value is too hairy in this case. Alternatively, we could have an object and an action. So the very hungry caterpillar will eat and have a series of parameters after that. One apple, two pears, three plums, and so forth. So in general, when we're looking at VBA, you're always going to have this sort of um, this sort of structure where you've got an object and you've got an action associated with it, or you've got an object and a property associated that needs to be changed. Um, an example that I've seen in the past is that um, if you think about a bird, a bird has a lot of different properties. 
um, it has wings, it has a beak, it has feet, and so on. And all of those properties can um, be different between different birds. Some might be very feathery, uh, some might be you know, a little bit bald, some might be sharp or pointy and so on. These are all different properties that you can have. Um, Whereas the methods are things that they, you know, a bird might swoop, it might fly, it might walk, it might eat, and so on. Um, I guess that's kind of the way of thinking about how VBA can be put together. <clears throat> so, in the context of actual Excel-based VBA, um, we might see an object such as range A1 to C5. Um, that's the cell, uh, those are the cells from A1 to C5. Um, we might have a property of those cells. The font uh, might be a type of property. The name of the font is a property of the font. So, you know, properties can have properties as well. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, if we were to take this bit of code and pop that into VBA, that would go and take that object, find the font in that object, and change the name of the font to be Arial. Um, the name being a property as opposed to, say, the size of the font or um, whether it was bold or underlined and so on. Um, another, another example of this, um, selection. Uh, selection is effectively an object that says, what have you selected in the worksheet at the moment? Um, sounds a little bit weird, but effectively, whatever you may have clicked on on the worksheet, whether it's, an, whether it's like a child object or whether it's a cell, that's what selection is all about. And so the object is this thing that we have selected already. And as far as doing actions, method, um, the method, copying, cutting, pasting, um, changing the value, um, or you know, typing something in, uh, those are all effectively actions that we can take. Um, creating a new sheet, for example. Um, these are all different sorts of actions that we might um, undergo in VBA. So we're going to start off from the very beginning. The idea is that uh, you know, we're not going to just throw you in. This is not a programming course. We're not expecting you to write macros from scratch. And I think for most people who don't have a computing background, um, their first foray into macros is to record a macro. Um, the basics of recording a macro would be to simply um, click on the start record button, um, which appears at the bottom left hand side of Excel if you've done it before. Or alternatively, you can go to the View tab, click on the Macros button, and click on Record Macro. So with that in mind, uh, we're going to jump out of PowerPoint, because uh, this, this is not a PowerPoint webinar, and we're going to pop into Excel. So um, in the bottom left-hand side, you can see here, this is my uh, Start Recording button. Hopefully, everyone can see the screen. Um, alternatively, you can jump up to the View tab, click on Macros, uh, or click on the, the um, the call out from the macros button and select record macro. So we're going to record a macro. A dialog box pops up saying we're going to record this. Um, where is it going to be stored? The description. I'm going to move, I'm going to sort of ignore all of that for now because we're just getting started. So I'm just going to hit OK because I think that's what most people will generally do when it comes to uh, sort of working with the macro for the first time. So um, let's do some things with this macro. Now, most people, when they are recording a macro or trying to work with macros for the first time, they're trying to automate a task that they have um, done on a manual basis over and over again. The idea being that perhaps we always have to type in a bunch of values into cells, copy it over here, create a new sheet, do something, and move around. So we can go through the same process again. Um, we can type in, say, the values one, two, three, four, and five, into these cells. It might be that we're going to copy and paste these values into uh, column E. Suppose then we need to create um, two new sheets. So we've got oof, sheet three and sheet four over here on the right hand side. And then we need to go back to the first sheet. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut control page up. So go back to sheet three and back to sheet one. So Taking a number of different steps, um, I'm going to, um, let's see, so there's anything else I want to do. Suppose that, you know what, I don't actually want this to be right up the top of the page. I want to insert a few rows. So right click insert, just to give me a little bit more space. 
And then we'll take this and highlight these cells because these were the initial inputs. I'm going to highlight them in yellow. Okay, I think that's probably enough. Um, we've played around with a few different things here. Uh, we will see how it goes. So let's click on the stop button, stop recording. Uh, alternatively, again, you could have gone up to view macros and uh, stop, uh, stop recording. And if you click on this macros button now, you'll be able to see that we've got this macro one. Um, running macro one will repeat exactly the same steps that we have just taken. So why don't we give that a go? I'm going to run macro one. It's going to plow through and it's done some really strange things. It's modified bits of the stuff that we've done, um, that we've worked on here. Um, you can see that it's inserted more rows. It's extended the size of our input area. It's created all these new sheets. Maybe that was unintentional. Maybe that's exactly what I wanted it to do. Um, either way, it's probably worthwhile taking a look at the actual code itself to see what's happened in this recording process. What steps has Excel actually taken to record what it is that I've just done? So to do this, there's a couple of different ways you can, you can get there. Um, one way is to go back into that macros option, um, find the macro one item, and then click on edit. Uh, an alternative would be to go to the developer tab. If you've got the developer tab on, on your ribbon, um, you can always customize your ribbon and add it there. And when you're on the developer tab, you can click on Visual Basic. And this will open up the Visual Basic editor. Uh, notice that when I mouse over this, it also gives me a little shortcut in brackets, Alt F11. Uh, for those people who love their keyboard shortcuts, uh, that's usually the one that you'll use to open up Visual Basic. So. Clicking on that brings me to the Visual Basic Editor. Um, this is basically the place where we can go off and change and play around with our macros. Um, the rough sort of setup of your Visual Basic Editor will look slightly different to mine because you can customize it in different ways. Um, but essentially, on the left-hand side, you've got on the top left, uh, the list of different sheets and workbooks that you have open, um, as well as the different macros that may have been uh, included in those workbooks. On the bottom left, you've got uh, properties about particular sheets um, or modules and things that you're working with. On the top right-hand side, this is where the code's gonna be. Now, when you record a macro, it creates what they call a module. Um, so we've got this module one that's attached to book one right now. Module one, if I double click on this, <clears throat> opens up on the top right-hand side, and I can see all the things that have just been done with my recorded macro. And there's a lot of things here, and there's also a lot of useless things here. So if we read this you know, bit by bit, and what I'm actually gonna do, I'm going to um, copy this text out, and I'm just gonna bring it into Excel so it's a bit easier to read, because one really annoying thing about VBA is that you can't actually resize your, uh, your fonts. So I'm gonna paste this over here into Excel so we can see. So first of all, the macro selects range C1, great. It types a value of one into C1, and then it moves to the next cell, types two, next cell, types three, and so on. So that's our, that's our first step, typing one to five into those first cells. Then it selected C1 to C5 and copied it, okay. Um, it selected E1 and then pasted it into E1. You scroll down. Added two sheets after, selected the previous sheet, and then selected the previous sheet again. That's our control page up. And then we uh, set rows one to four, and we inserted rows, copying them. You see a lot of uh, different properties about this. Excel down, copy origin, Excel format from left, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all of this is essentially that act of inserting rows above this above the section that we've highlighted. Um, and this is one of those things, I guess, that <clears throat> just happens when we're working in, um, in Excel. It kind of, um, it kind of makes some assumptions about what it is that we're doing and ensures that the VBA reflects that. So range C5 to C9, uh, and then this final step of shading the, um, shading the cells yellow. Now, there's a lot here. Um, that isn't necessarily very useful to us. Um, 
One thing to note, I guess, is that this C1 to C5, uh, that was good to start off with. But one problem with this is that when we inserted rows later on, C1 to C5 aren't actually in the same place. So this has caused problems. So the entering of those values where it was previously in C1 to C5 subsequently, subsequently became C5 to C9. Um, and then eventually after it got after rows were inserted again, it became C9 to C13. So one thing to consider when we're recording macros is are the cells that we're actually referring to always going to be the same cells? Um, should we be referring to C1 to C5? Um, and if we insert rows, will it be C5 to C9? Or should it actually still be C1 to C5? Um, because the way that we're actually planning on using the spreadsheet will influence how we actually want to set up our, our VBA code, which we'll come back to in a second. There's also a bunch of, I guess, less useful steps. So this notion of selecting the cell and then doing something and selecting a cell and doing something. Um, you know, we're selecting range C1 to C5 and then we're copying it. A lot of that's a little bit unnecessary almost. Uh, we, could, we could definitely clean this up. Um, <clears throat> and that kind of brings us nicely, I guess, into the next part of our uh, presentation, which is all about how do you go off and clean up these, uh, these different steps? Let me just high level do's. So we can avoid using um, these cell references. We can try and remove unintended macro steps. Um, <clears throat> and effectively try and reduce the amount of stuff that's going on. Um, <clears throat> if we can try and avoid using dot copy as well, um, copying and clipboard interactions always kind of weird in VBA, because if you're running a macro and it's running in the background, it's using the clipboard and you go off into Word and you want to use the clipboard, um, it doesn't tend to like it very much. Excel, like Microsoft has managed to put in some reasonably good um, collision handling for that, but, um, in the old days, certainly, it used to <laughs> generate a lot of problems. So these are some things that you might want to avoid when it comes to using um, or recording recording macros and trying to clean them up in the process. So there are some things that we could do instead. Um, so instead of copying values, we could um, use x equals y type code instead. So saying the value of this cell should be equal to the value of that cell. Or the formula of the cell should be equal to the formula of the other cell. Um, it could be that um, if we're going to uh, have a select and then selection copy, maybe we can put those steps into one and try and clean it up that way. So going back to our code, um, what we could see here, perhaps instead of going range C1 select and then taking that active cell and setting the formula to be equal to one, we clean that up. We could take this formula bit because that's the property of the cell, the formula setting it to one, and we could put that into the first, first section. So instead of taking the action of selecting C1, we could simply say the cell C1 set the formula to be equal to a value of one. And then I don't need the second step at all. It's just a single uh, process, which makes it a lot faster when we're working in VBA. So there's a bunch of cleanup that we could do there in order to spruce things up. Um, we could, if I re just repeat this process for all the other steps, let's get rid of all of these formula R1C1s. Let's just uh, clean this up quickly. Um, <clears throat> then I can get rid of every second step there. Um, where I've got range C1 to C5 select and then copy, well, I could just copy it from the outside. I don't need to select it first and then go somewhere else and copy. Now the second, this, this paste bit is a little bit different because where previously copying and formulas were actions and uh, properties of different range objects, the paste command in Excel is a little bit different. Paste, when you hit control V, is essentially pasting from the sheet. It's not something that's specifically to do with a cell. Um, and so if you wanted to, to have a paste action that's directly related to the cell, um, what you'll find is that it's actually a paste special um, that where you're pasting, pasting all. 
Um, so if I were to just show you quickly, uh, let me expand out Excel. If I were to copy this range here, if I paste special, so instead of hitting Control V, I can hit Control Alt V, for example, um, <clears throat> it would be this paste all in, in the paste special dialog box. And so if I can just show you quickly how this would work, let me record a really quick macro about this. If we select these cells, copy, uh, select the next cell, paste special, paste all. Let's stop that and let's go check out in VBA what that looks like. So E5, we're going to selection.paste special where the paste command is paste all, the operation is XL none, skip blanks is false, transpose is false. All the rest of those bits were just different properties of the paste special dialog. But key thing here is that um, we're taking a range and selecting it, and then we're taking that selection and pasting it. We're not just pasting from the sheet. And so this paste special command is something that we could use for our, our paste if we're trying to combine things together with the range directly. So if I take the paste special, paste Excel all, don't really need any of the rest of it. You go back into my original select and then remove the active sheet dot paste. So these are all things that I can do to kind of clean up my macro and make it a little bit um, shorter, but faster to run. Um, it means it's also a lot easier to read too. <clears throat> So I'm going to ignore a lot of the rest of these things just because it's you know, perhaps a little bit less relevant for us right now and doesn't really kind of go with what we want to talk about. But I do want to highlight um, this section that we use to highlight different cells. So when we selected the cells and we, um, and we actually sort of just set that yellow highlight, it, well, VBA generated a whole bunch of different code for us. It said the pattern of the cell is going to be solid. Pattern color is going to be automatic. The color is going to be 65535, which I'm assuming is this lovely bright yellow color. But then we've got this tint and shade equals zero, pattern tint and shade equals zero. So it's making some assumptions about everything else in the cell that I might not actually want. So in that sense, I might actually want to get rid of those steps that aren't relevant so that only the yellow highlight is coming through. This is going to be really important because let me show you what happens when you record a font change. So I'm going to hit record again. We're going to select these cells. We're going to go back to the home tab and I'm going to change it from Calibri to Arial. There's Arial. Here we go. And then I'm going to hit stop. Now, when you change a font to Arial, let's go to VBA and see what it does. It's generated this massive bit of code over here. Let's see what it looks like. I'll put it on the right-hand side of the screen. So with this, this range, we'll select it first. And then when you select it, I simply converted from Calibri to Arial, which is this first step, name equals Arial. But it's also made this assumption that I want a size to be 24. I want the strike through to be false, superscript to be false, subscript to be false, and so on, so on, so on. So suppose if I were to change this font to be size 36, suppose I were to apply a strike through effect to this font, and then I run that macro again. Let's go back to macro, uh, view macros and let's run macro three, which was my font change. I only wanted the font change to change it from Calibri to Arial. But what it's done, it's actually overridden the size and the strike through features that I put in place as well. So this is one, um, I guess, risky thing about just recording a macro and then assuming it's going to do everything that you want it to do without actually going back and checking whether it's you know, working correctly. Um, VBA will record a bunch of properties at the same time about a font, uh, cell color, and all the rest of that. Um, and sometimes it will basically take the values that were existing in the cell without necessarily thinking that that's the exact change that you wanted to make. So when you're recording these macros, do go back and check to see whether all these things are actually relevant, in case they're not, 
and you can basically trim it down so that it's nice and neat and only affecting the item that you're actually looking for. Um, even in this case, we could actually trim this down again now where we could get rid of the select item and just go straight to the font and the name equals Arial. And that would just be so much faster than selecting it and then running the script that goes off and, and changes the font and changes the size and changes all these other properties. So, perils of recording macros. These are why, um, I guess, I wanted to highlight a couple of really key things here to basically make sure that if you are going to record macros, you're not going to, um, I guess, you know, let it do silly things. Just make sure that you um, clean it up before you actually go off into it. Double check if I have anything else here. Um, so yes, in terms of cell references, we've got references to C5, um, C1, and so forth. Now, if we if we want the the macro to refer to that range of cells, um, but we want that range of cells to move around the spreadsheet while we're working with them. So if I were to insert rows at the top of the spreadsheet, it's not going to um, you know, keep using C5 and C1 and so forth. I want it to be the new C9 or the new C13. Um, we can use named ranges. So how do we use named ranges? Suppose I'm working with this range of cells here. This is currently C5 to C13, as we recorded previously. But if I were to insert a row, let me insert one row here, C5 to C13 is now this range, which doesn't really help me. Um, it means one thing about uh, VBA compared to Excel, if I were to add a formula at the bottom of this page, sum equals C5 to C13, and then I insert a row, formula in Excel will automatically update and it'll change from C5 to C13 to C6 to C14. Uh, which is a really nice property of Excel, one of the most amazing things. If you, if you really think about how that works, um, that's actually pretty special. VBA doesn't have that same sort of logic. Uh, if I've inserted rows, make it C6 to, to C14, um, if I go back to VBA, it still says C5 to C13, because this is effectively hard-coded into the VBA formula. Now, there's a trick to getting around this, and that's using a feature called named ranges. And apologies if some of you have run into this before, um, but just for those who haven't, a named range is effectively a way of referring to a cell or a group of cells um, using a name rather than using a cell reference. So this C5 to C13 range here, for example, I could refer to this as my macro range. Um, and to do that, I can basically click on the name box in the top left-hand side of Excel and type in macro range and hit enter. Key thing with names, can't have spaces. You need to hit enter if you're going to uh, um, sort of lock it in in the name. A lot of people I know will, will type what they have in and then click somewhere else on the screen and it won't save the name range. So please do be careful about that. Now the name box, um, well, once we've, once we've created this named range, we can actually see what named ranges we have by going to the formulas tab in Excel and clicking on this name manager. This will show us all of the different uh, named ranges that we've created in our model. So we can see here, we've got this range called macro range and it refers to C5 to C13 in this sheet. Now, if I were to insert a new row and I go back to the name manager, you'll see that this now becomes C6 to C14. So clearly the name is adapting to changes in the spreadsheet, just like formally adapt to changes in the spreadsheet. Brilliant. Now, one thing that we can do is go back to um, VBA or go back to the code where we've taken from VBA and instead of referring to C5 to C13, we could refer to the macro underscore range. And what this will do, rather than pointing to C5 to C13, which was a block of cells that may have moved and changed from its original location, it's now pointing to the macro range and it will effectively go to the name manager check where macro range actually exists in our spreadsheet and then go to that location. So this is a great way of circumventing the fact that VBA can't follow changes in the spreadsheet, but it can follow names which also follow changes in the spreadsheet. Um, 
So this is a, a really useful way of making sure that your macros don't break after you record them. One of the most common problems that we see in recorded macros is when people will record a macro and it works fine until someone inserts a new column or someone renames a sheet or someone does something else silly that you'd think wouldn't have any material impact because it doesn't change the way calculations in Excel work, but it does impact the VBA. And then they're confused. They can't follow what's going on. <clears throat> so this is a this is a, a way to fix a common problem that happens. Let's see. What else should we do? What else should we consider? We should probably make sure that we pay attention to the sheet context. So when we talk about range A1, that would refer to range A1 of whatever sheet that you've actually selected at that point in time. So if I were to go back to uh, Excel again, and I start off in sheet five, and if I were to run um, that, that cell, that thing that changes the font to Arial again, to run that, that's gonna change it in C5 to C13 in this sheet, not in sheet one, which is where the original cells were. And that's because we haven't actually specified to Excel what sheet we're working on. So if you do want to make sure that Excel makes this change in a specific sheet, you're going to need to specify the sheet object before you talk about the range. Um, so that's just something to consider. Um, I know plenty of people have made this error where they record a macro, it works perfectly fine where they've recorded it, and then they try and run it from another sheet and suddenly it doesn't work. That's, this is why, basically. The second point here in this things to do list is to use comments. Comments are effectively um, a, a tool in VBA to leave notes for other people. Um, you can do this by putting a single inverted comma at the front of a line. So let me go to VBA and let's take this section. You can see the, rec the recording process adds several comments already. Uh, let's create a new section here. I'm gonna put an inverted comma in front uh, and we're gonna write the note. Uh, this section will change the font in the target cells to Arial. When I move away, uh, it highlights that particular row in green. The green basically says VBA will not run this code. So this is not code that should be run in VBA. Um, if you find that there's a whole block of things that you want to comment out, uh, and also you can use comments to basically remove code from being run at any point in time. So say we've got all these steps for this font, font change that we want to adjust, um, but maybe we don't want to delete it because we're not sure if we need it yet. We just comment it out. Um, there's this comment block tool in the edit toolbar that you can use to comment the whole lot out, it turns it all green, it means that it won't be run. So the only things that will be run are the selection, um, select font and change the font name to Arial. So these are ways that we can uh, basically provide further notes for other people who might be using, using VBA. Um, what I tend to find when we're looking at people who work in VBA and record macros in particular is that they record the macro and then there's no notes to kind of explain what this macro is intended to do. And so when we're asked to come through and try and fix things, um, it'll refer to range C5 to C13, and we've got no idea what that actually means because things have moved around so much. So comments, at least, will kind of let people know what, what the intention of your code is supposed to be, if you go back and actually leave notes for them. Um, the last thing I've got in this things to do list is this thing called option explicit. Um, and this allows you to basically force variables to be declared. Now, I kind of skimmed over what variables were, but variables are effectively ways that you can define um, you know, short-term values. Um, you can store and reuse short-term values uh, over and over again. Um, option explicit basically just um, forces you to identify what a variable is. So you know, this variable name is a sheet or it's a, it's a value, it's an integer or a string text. Um, and it just it helps identify cases where variable names are misused. Um, honestly speaking, this is probably less relevant for people who are just getting started into VBA and playing around with macros. But <clears throat> It is, you will see it when you see code online. Um, you will see that um, people will refer to it and kind of, <clears throat> kind of 
kind of require you to use it. <clears throat> and it's something that definitely does help if you do start using it and you start playing around with variables. So let's talk about a couple of fairly simple loops and conditions. <clears throat> so we've got two sorts of conditions and loops to talk about. If, then, else is the first one. Uh, this is the equivalent of our if function in Excel, um, but in VBA. So this allows for some conditional rules to be basically checked and, and done with. Basic syntax is we start off with if a condition is true, then we do something else, we do something else, and if. So let me jump back to Excel quickly, just to highlight how this could possibly work. Um, suppose we have, um, uh, let's find a value over here, um, 10. So we could say, if the range C1 value is greater than 10, then, then we're going to do something here. And I'm going to oops, let's make sure that's an inverted comma so we can see it. Else, we're going to do something else here. And if. This would be the equivalent of saying if um, C1 is greater than 10, then do something here. Otherwise, do something else here. For those of you who are happier working in Excel. So this, I guess, conversion of if, then, else, and if is basically the equivalent of if um, and our different items in our standard if function. <clears throat> okay. So let's, let's have a think how we can actually use this in some code. Um, I'm going to open up our VBA editor. So also for 11 to bring that up. And I'm going to create a new macro. Um, and I'm going to write this one from scratch because we're just doing something pretty basic here. Every macro needs to start off with uh, sub, uh, which is short for subroutine, and then the name of the macro. So why don't we call this, um, let's see, if macro. So we're going to make some space on the right-hand side of our screen to write in a little if macro. So let's start off. If range C1 dot value is greater than 10. So I'm referring specifically to this sheet. Fair enough, we can work with that. Then we can do something here. Else, we're going to do something else here. And this. So what can we actually do? Maybe we can take that value and we could add one to it. So we could take, um, we want range c1 dot value um, equals 11. Now, if it's greater than 10, I want it to reduce by one. So let's go, uh, let's set it to be equal to 10. If it's not greater than 10, then we'll make it range c1 dot, dot value equals 11. So this is basically going to swap the values from 10 to 11 and then back and forth again. Really simple example. This is clearly not a commercial example that's, that's practical, but hopefully we'll be able to see how this actually works. Now, when I run this macro, and I can run macros from the Visual Basic Editor, if you click on the subroutine that you want to run, the macro that you want to run, you can press the F5 key on your keyboard, and that will run the macro. You can see the value has gone from 10 to 11. If I hit F5 again, it's going to swap back to 10, and so forth. Now, Another way that you can interact with the VBA editor is to press F8. What F8 does is it highlights the next step that you're about to act, uh, you're about to take action on in VBA, and sort of pauses before you take that step, and allows you to basically take stock of what's going on before you hit F8 again and step into this process. So here, we're about to run this check. Is the value in C1 greater than 10? Um, let's hit F8 again to run it. No, it's not greater than 10, so it's going to do the something else item. Um, hit F8 again. It's about to change the value to 11, so we'll hit F8, and we'll see the value in C1 go from 10 to 11. And then it'll exit the if statement and exit the macro. 
Likewise, if we do that again, if we start off F8, F8, is the value greater than 10? Yes, that's true. So it's going to take that first step, change the value back to 10. So if you're ever wondering how does a VBA, how does VBA code actually work? And so if you're trying to debug and understand why is this breaking, you can actually go through into the macro and run it step by step by hitting that F8 key in order to just basically understand what's going on um, and you know, do it one line at a time. And then you can see exactly the line that's breaking and then you can go back to Excel and understand what the context in the sheet is for why it might be breaking. So F5 and F8 are really useful tools. The if statement itself, is a really useful tool to be able to basically switch logic. So under one condition, you're going to do something. Under another condition, you're going to do something else. Um, often, um, I see in the commercial world, um, specifically in finance, that you have macros that will keep running until something happens, right? So you might be waiting for a cell to go to a value of zero, and then it will stop running. And so often you'll have if conditions that will basically check if the value is zero or check if it's not zero and then take some sort of action associated with that. So speaking of running things over and over again, um, I thought we'd introduce another tool, which is the for, um, for and next. So this repeats a set of code a fixed number of times. Basic syntax, so x equals one to 10. So from a value going from one to 10, incrementing each time. Um, do something in between this code. So let's play around with this. Uh, I'm going to jump back into Excel and jump back to VBA, and we'll create a new macro, sub four macro. So here I can use some basic, um, basic code for x equals one to 10, and then uh, next x. That's how, that's how this, our basic for loop. Um, so it's going to take x being a value of one, process whatever code that's in between the steps, and then jump to the next next value. So it'll go from one to two, from two to three, three to four, and so on. So in this case, why don't I say um, the cell? I don't know if anyone knows their square numbers. Uh, let's go range a one dot value equals x times x. Except I don't want it to be cell A1 specifically. I want to combine that with this X. So it'll be range A1, and then I'll go to range A2, range A3, and so on. Um, so square numbers. Maybe I can do some cube numbers as well. Range uh, B and X dot value equals X times X times X. And so if I were to step through this macro one at a time, step, step, step. So x equals one, and if you're ever wondering as you're stepping through, what is the value of x? I'm not sure if this is actually showing up on the uh, web, uh, webinar screen, but if you mouse over the x value, if you're playing along, um, you'll see it brings up a tooltip that says x equals one. Um, with x equals one, that kind of shows you where you're incrementing the values are at a certain point in time. So uh, let me run this. A1, the value will be one times one. B1 will be a value of one times one times one. Great. And let's repeat this process for all the other permutations of you know, one, x equals one to 10. And if I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, that looks right, I'm happy to let it continue to the end. I can press F5 now and let it run to the very end. Brilliant. And you know, this is all the squaring cube, uh, cube numbers from one to 10. If I wanted to make that 100, I can simply change the for loop to go from one to 100 instead, rerun it, and that will now give me all the numbers going down to uh, A100 and B100 as well. So some sim simple applications of the for loop. Now the for loop, um, can be used with some other tools as well. So you could say, for example, um, work with for each sheet in um, all the sheets in your in your workbook. Um, so if you wanted to run something on every single sheet, uh, that would be how you do it. So for each sheet and sheets, um, next sheet at the bottom, and then your code would be something that interacts with that particular sheet. Um, I've seen this used in ranges of cells as well. So for each range in this you know, C5 to C13, do something to each cell one at a time. Um, it's been nice ways of using this for and next loops. So before we um, kind of run out of time, I thought I'd highlight 
ways to find good code online. So a couple of things you want to consider when you're looking at code online, because generally speaking, as you're starting to get into this process, you're not going to know everything you need. And often the best way to kind of learn how to use VBA is to go online to different forums, different websites, and different blogs, and just see how do other people do it. And then you kind of take ideas from other people, you learn how to apply them, you adapt them in different ways, and eventually you kind of build up a toolkit of different code and different things that you'll use. So a couple of things to consider. Um, when you're looking at code online, does it follow good coding practice? Um, so is it well laid out? Um, does it use indenting and comments? Comments are really critical for explaining what different things do. Indenting is the thing that I kind of did innately and I didn't really call it out. So let me go back to VBA quickly and highlight that. You'll see with this four section, um, I've got the four and the next on the sort of aligned to the left-hand side. But then this range section is kind of indented in a few spaces. Uh, this is what indenting is. It's when the, the text that you have is kind of away or offset from uh, the base text. And this is something that's generally good practice to do when you're working with loops, when you're working with if conditions, uh, because it kind of tells you at what level you're working with that code. Um, it's not necessary. The code itself doesn't require you to indent. But what it does show is that whoever's put this code together has had a little bit of foresight to actually think about how you might want to read the code. And so anything that's been indented, you know, will be somewhere in between the for and the next loop. Likewise, anything that's indented in my if section will be prior to the else and the prior to the end if items. So this is why indenting is kind of important. Um, <clears throat> what else can we consider? Does the code use named ranges instead of direct cell references? Uh, is that something that um, whoever's writing the code has considered when they're building this building this code? Um, and part of that you know, might not necessarily be um, necessary when someone's responding to a forum post and you're just doing a really quick um, hack and slash VBA thing to put it together for someone. Uh, but if someone's writing a blog and they're, they're sort of talking about how to use VBA, unless they're kind of explicitly saying that, look, we're just keeping it simple and using cell references, uh, generally speaking, named ranges kind of speaks to the idea that, hey, it's going to be it's going to be easier to work with. Um, and you know that you know that they're, they're thinking about the long term life of the CBA code. Um, are variables declared explicitly? That's that option explicit thing that I was talking about before. Has someone actually said? X is an integer, and this is how we're going to use X. So those are kind of the good coding practice things that you might want to look for um, to identify good code. Um, so if you're just looking at a random website or you know, something on tech community, something um, on you know, MrExcel.com and so on, and you're seeing the CBA code and it doesn't kind of follow good coding practice, that might not be the best bit of code to, uh, to use. If you're looking at different blogs, if you're looking at, um, you know, say, things on Reddit, how well is the code regarded by the community? Um, you can measure this in likes, upvotes. Um, if you're looking at blogs by other MVPs, um, those are kind of indications that you know, people respect the, the work. Um, a bit of code that has a lot of likes will generally be one that is going to be better generally speaking, you know, all other things equal, than code with not many likes or, you know, lots of downvotes and so on. Um, generally speaking, the MVPs are going to have uh, some pretty good blogs as well. Um, so if you follow any of the MVPs who write a lot of uh, VBA code, um, they're also in a really good spot to, you know, give you good advice and, um, and help you out. But most importantly, and forget, forgetting about all the rest of that, key question is, can you actually follow what it's doing? And so the important thing um, about any code is that you don't run it unless you can actually understand what it's trying to do. So if you're looking down through the code, can you see it's, it's stepping from A to B to C? Um, can you follow what the actual command is? So in all the code that we've been looking at so far in recording, it kind of makes sense. We're selecting this, we're copying that, we're changing the font to be X and so on. Um, it might not be plain language, but generally speaking, we can understand and translate it back into Excel terminology. And so if you're going online and you're finding bits of code, that would be probably the, the thing that I would consider most important. Can you actually follow what it is that they're saying? Um, 
because there's no point in blindly copying and pasting code online if it if it doesn't really make sense it might solve your problem but it'll be really hard to debug in the future um, so that that's just something that you really ought to consider so in the last few minutes we've got left I thought I'd highlight a bunch of other tools that are available to you because VPA is not the, well, it's not the be all and end all of automation tools that are available in Excel, especially not in what we might call modern Excel. Um, I seem to recall that there was a comment on um, Facebook or Twitter and one of the one of the Microsoft posts that were advertising this uh, this session about, you know, does that mean that uh, that there's going to be big advancements in VBA for um, you know after it's been kind of ignored for a while? And well, honestly speaking, um, and this is someone who's not working for Microsoft and is just a you know, little MVP. Um, Microsoft has done a pretty good job in keeping VBA up to date with a lot of the modern Excel changes. Um, we can still use VBA to control um, things in you know, Power Pivot and Power Query and so on. Um, we, can, we can still use VBA to you know, build dynamic array formulae. So it's, it's keeping up to date. Um, there haven't been ma massive changes to the interface because it doesn't need changes to the interface. Everyone's generally pretty comfortable with where it is. So with that in mind, I thought I'd talk about some of the other tools you would use to actually automate things in a modern Excel world. Um, <clears throat> and so here are the three that I've kind of highlighted are particularly useful. Power Query, Office Scripts, and Power Automate, or Flow, if you've um, heard of it in its former name. Uh, I'll talk about the last two really quickly first. Office Scripts is essentially the equivalent of VBA for the web, for all intents and purposes. Um, <clears throat> The idea is that you can record um, or write your own um, scripts, uh, which uses TypeScript effectively. Um, and you can use that to basically do very similar things to what we've done just now. Um, Power Automate is a really cool tool that allows you to uh, basically set up processes that will run at a on, on events or certain triggers or when, when something happens. So for example, if an email comes through with some budget data that you need to bring into your Excel spreadsheet, uh, you can set up Power Automate to look through your emails and every time an email comes in, check if it's this budget email that you're waiting for. And if it is, take the values from that email and put it into your spreadsheet. Um, this can just be done automatically. So you might set up a, a standalone email address that just looks for those details. Um, that's Another form of automation that you know, VBA couldn't even dream of right now. With, with VBA, you'd kind of need to uh, have something in VBA itself, and then maybe you could set up a bit of VBA code to um, connect to Outlook and look through your emails and find the emails you're looking for and bring it in. And you'd need to manually run that process, whereas Power Automate kind of automatically checks for them, assuming that you're using um, Exchange Online and that it'll, it'll kind of interact with Excel Online as well. So your computer doesn't need to be switched on at that time to run these. But I think the thing that's probably closest to VBA is this first one, Power Query. Uh, Power Query is an extract, transform, load tool that's available in Excel 2016 and later, or an add-in for Excel 2013. Uh, and it is effectively taking the role of a lot of tasks that people were previously using VBA for, um, going off and transforming and splitting columns and deleting rows and filtering things and so forth. Um, a lot of that's done in Power Query, and I thought in the last few minutes I'd do a really quick demonstration of how that actually works. So I've hidden the sheet back here. Um, let me just unhide this, which takes a look at data from IMDb. Um, so the Internet Movie Database. This is the top 250 movies as rated by all you good folks on the internet. So it's not very clean at the moment. Suppose I want to split up this rank and title. Um, rank the title, the year that a movie was made. I want to get rid of all these other columns. This is basically the equivalent of downloading the data straight from the website with no cleanup. Now, I'm going to do a really quick thing on Power Query here to show you how it works. Let me just edit this and open it up, Power Query. Let me pull this onto the correct screen. This is not intended to be a Power Query session, and certainly I think um, Ken Pauls and Miguel Escobar are running a session on Power Query in a few months' time, uh, so do definitely check out that webinar. Uh, but just to give you a little taster for it, let's see how quickly I can clean this up. Uh, suppose that I split this column uh, by the full stop and the space at the front. 
So just the leftmost time. Suppose I split the column on the right-hand side. Um, we'll split it by the space bracket on the rightmost time. And then let's get rid of this bracket at the end of our years and then convert this to a number. So let's make this a whole number. So no more of that text becoming, uh, or numbers becoming text as it gets brought into Excel. Change the columns, there's our rank, here's our title, and here's the year that it was made. And then we'll just take these columns, the rank, title, year that it was made, and the ratings, and we'll remove everything else. And now, top left-hand side, we can close, load this to Excel. So in doing that, oops, what have I done? I double-clicked on that, that was an accident. So in doing this, this has basically cleaned up the data from its, um, I guess, you know, straight up copy paste in the website form into something that's a lot neater, that's ready to be used. But most importantly, if I were to go to the data tab and hit refresh, what that will do, that'll actually go back to the website, download the data again, and run all of those steps that we just took to clean up our data set. And it'll repeat that over and over again every time we refresh that in the future. Um, if we go back to the query, you'll see on the right-hand side of the query editor, um, there's a section here called Applied Steps. And this is effectively your macro recorder within the Power Query interface. So Power Query is effectively macros for specifically for data transformation and data cleansing. So all of these steps, you can see how it goes from the initial data that we had, splitting the column, um, changing the type the rank from text to numbers, splitting the column again, and so on. And so I can take, take a look at every step and see how it's transformed the data from start to finish. Um, and these are the steps that will be taken in the future. So close that. Power Query is a really cool tool. Uh, if you do, or if you, if you do have the opportunity to, I highly recommend you check out the other webinars um, that have Power Query related things. Uh, to me, that's probably one of the most amazing parts of what is you know, widely considered as modern Excel nowadays. Um, so, if anyone has any particular questions, more than happy to, to take some of those. I believe you've got an interface to be able to uh, ask questions and that'll get passed to me by a moderator. Um, but otherwise, uh, this is really all I wanted to talk about. Um, do make sure you check out the other webinars that are available. I think next month we've got um, something on, um, so let me just pull it open here, Modern Excel webinars. So next month, um, Echo is running a session on, run, on creating more effective charts. We've got Wynn running tips and tricks in May. And then in June, that's the data prep techniques with Power Query with Ken Pauls and Miguel Escobar. Uh, that's the one I reckon you probably ought to check out if you want to see more about what that Power Query automation tool is. Um, so if no one has any particular questions, I'll, uh, I'll basically wrap up now. Um, so we'll probably stop recording shortly and yeah, I'll hang around in case anyone does want to ask anything. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you are, uh, if you are curious about you know where, where you can contact us, you can always email us at contact at someproduct.com. Some product uh, is named after the Excel function. Um, you may have seen this before if you check out some of the other webinars, um, in particular Liam Bastic's webinar. Um, so he and I work together in Australia. Um, you can check out our website. We've actually got a blog on VBA and how to use VBA, how to sort of get into it um, and start using it. So you can check that out at the thought page on our website. Otherwise, um, thank you very much for joining us and look forward to seeing everyone for the next webinar.